Okay, all right. What did y'all think of that? She was strong. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Deliberate. What? Deliberate. Deliberate. Okay. What else? Fearless. Fearless? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, every time she does that, somebody's going to hear that and decide they want they need to kill her. Okay, not only that, God wants them to kill her because that's the version of Islam they're being taught. What else? Peaceful. Peaceful. Yeah. So is, is strong and powerful the opposite of peaceful? No, absolutely not. She was both, I, I mean, you know, she's almost serene in delivering her message. Okay, and what was her message? Education, okay? You need peace to have education, and education will give you peace. So it's sort of a cyclical thing that we can't expect to win, the, you know, to, to stop wars by killing more people, okay? What else was her message? Women, women to be independent and strong. I like it when she says, you know, in the past, women have asked men to stand up for them, but this time we're going to do it for ourselves. When they cut to the audience, there are three uh, uh, Emiratis, guys from the UAE, men from the UAE, sitting in the back that are just going like. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's one time she says it when they're, they're just sitting there. Okay? So, yeah, women have to empower themselves. What else? What, what else was her message? Wasn't the delivery how she always, like, she starts each part with you, our, yeah, your brothers and sisters she, and brothers? She says, she says both, actually. Yeah. She, and then one time she says, dear fellows. Yeah. But usually it's, it, she transitions. You know, I tell you, you got to have explicit transitions between her, your main points. They, that doesn't have to be. And my next main point is, I do that just to make sure you, you explicitly do it. But uh, Malala goes, my dear brothers and sisters, or my dear sisters and brothers. Every time she transitions. Okay? What else did she say? What are some of the other things she said? One thing that you know, really grabbed me. What else did you guys hear? So if there's a teenager in the world, and she's like 17 in when this is done. If there's a teenager in the world that has the right to be angry, it's her. Somebody, because she, all she wanted was an education. Somebody shot her in the head, okay? She was forced out of her home, all right, and I've never been to the Swat Valley. I've seen pictures of it. I've seen valleys just on the other side of the, the border in Afghanistan that are just stunningly beautiful places. We don't think about Afghanistan and Pakistan as being beautiful. But Swat Valley is supposedly one of the most beautiful places in the world. She can never live there again. Okay? She's been back once for a very short period of time with a large contingent for the Pakistani army to give her security. But she can never return to her home. Okay? She is under constant death threats. All right? And she's 17. She's in high school when she does this. Okay? Was she angry? No. In fact, what did she say? What is the exact opposite of she? What did she actually say? She said she had a gun. She wouldn't shoot her. She said she had a gun. She would not shoot the Talib that shot her. This was the, and then, then she says one of the great parts of the speech. She says, this is what I learned from Muhammad. The prophet, the prophet of peace, okay? She, uh, and she, and Jesus Christ and the Buddha. She then identifies Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mother Teresa. She finds all these influences from all faith communities, all cultures to bring, to include in her message, okay? Which again, would have pissed a lot of people off and made them want to kill her. And yet she just keeps up and keeps doing it. Okay, but she also has a message of forgiveness that she says, and I think one of the coolest thing is that I learned from my mother and father. Okay, and they're sitting there, and you can tell. I mean, she steps up there and starts talking, and you can see her mom doing this because you know, I mean, it's a very mom moment. Okay, dad's like sitting there, like, mm, you know, but their mom's just bawling. Okay, which I think is really cool. The thing I, I, I like about um, Malala Yousafzai is she is at the same time. You, it would be one thing if she was like this stone pillar, but she's clearly not. And the more you follow her and the more you, you see her, you begin to more and more realize this is just, for the most part, I think she's just turned 21. She's a teenager. 
but she's made an honorary citizen of Canada and she goes and she addresses Canada, the Canadian Parliament and she completely fangirls out on Justin Trudeau. I mean, she's like, you know, she's giggly, she blushes, she's, you know, whenever she tries to look at him, she gets all flustered. I mean, you know, and, and again, I hate to interpret, you know, how she's feeling, but it appears to me she's got quite a crush on the Canadian Prime Minister, and let's face it, so do I. I'll be honest with you, okay? But she's so human when she's doing it. And you see her in interviews, and they said, tell us what your life is like. She goes, I've got two younger brothers that I fight with all the time. I mean, everybody should be able to relate to that. And yet, now she's about to graduate from Oxford. Now, when you're filling out a college application and they go, awards, Nobel Peace Prize, okay? <laughs> uh, activities, address the United Nations General Assembly, address the Canadian Parliament, okay, that's gonna kind of push your application to the top. But since she's been there, she's volunteered as like what we would call a campus ambassador. She's volunteered as a campus ambassador. She's volunteered as a, a, a sort of a floor, you know, uh, a leader, you know, if you in, into Harry Potter. She's the head girl for her dorm, okay? I mean, she's really engaged in all those things you would expect a college student to be engaged in, okay? And all the time, she's out there preaching not just forgiveness, but the one thing I really like that she says, I spent a large part of my adult life looking at terrorism, okay? It's what I did for a living for 15 plus years. Okay, before that, it was the Soviet Union, and then suddenly it became terrorism. The average extremist, and it doesn't, and I'm not saying Islamic extremist, because if you look here in the United States and you now look at New Zealand, the average extremist that's going to carry out acts of terrorism is a young male. That's just statistically true. Okay? And they tell them that they are the greatest warriors, they are the fiercest people, they are the example that all should follow. They, you know, they, they, they say, Ismu, uh, Ismu Asad Allah, your name will be the Lion of God, okay? Here you've got this 17-year-old female high school student saying, yeah, they're very afraid of me because I want everyone to have an education. They're afraid of books. They're afraid of pens. They are afraid of you getting an education. I mean, it just brings them down to exactly who they are, and they despise her for it and they want to kill her for it. And yet every day, she's right back living that life, living that example every single day. Yeah, so I, I, I watch her speeches because if, like I said you know, the other day, if you can't be uplifted by Malala Yousafzai's story, you're dead inside. You really need to re-examine your life, okay? Because everything we've taken for granted, she's almost lost her life for. The ability to speak, the ability to get an education, all those things. Okay? Anybody have any questions? Any more comments? Mm -hmm. All right. I had a marker here. Okay. So today we're going to talk about listening. Okay. And that is so attractive a camera angle. Okay. Why do we talk about listening? It's a public speaking course, not a public listening course, right? Why do we talk about listening? Okay. I'm going to be talking in a minute about physical noise. All you rustling in your backpacks. Or creating physical noise. Say that again, please. Oh, to understand. We talk about, but why do we as public speakers care about listening? To understand what our audience is hearing. What? To understand what our audience is hearing. Yeah, because if the audience isn't listening to you, what are you doing up here? Yeah, everybody's seen Charlie Brown's. I heard you know, when I say, you sound just like Charlie Brown's teacher. Everybody knows what Charlie Brown's teacher sounds like. Wah, 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 wah. Okay? All right. As I've told you, none of this is new. Remember we talked about the Aristotelian model and we talked about Aristotle and Socrates way back you know, at the beginning of the course? Aristotle said, for of the three elements in speech making, speech, speaker, subject, and person addressed, it is the last one, the hearer, that determines the speech's end and objective. Okay? So when you're giving a speech, the effectiveness of your speech isn't going to be determined by how great you followed all the concepts and precepts of public speaking. Your effectiveness as a public speaker is going to be determined by what people were listening to. Okay? So let's talk today about listening. A couple of definitions. You don't have to write these down. 
Dictionary.com defines listening as to give attention with the ear, attend closely for the purpose of hearing. Merriam-Webster, to pay attention to sound. Oxford English Dictionary, give one's attention to a sound, take notice of an act of what someone says. To listen for or listen out for, North American colloquialism in the imperative, listen up. Okay? So what does all that say about listening? Giving your attention. It's you're giving your attention. Let's talk a bit about the difference between hearing and listening. Yeah, well, everybody has either said it. If you have children, you probably said it. If you were a child, everybody in here pretty much was a child at one point in their lives, right? Not, not me. No, I came in here fully formed two weeks ago looking just like this. Okay? Are you listening to me? And I would used to look at my mother and say, you're standing three feet from me and you're yelling. How am I? Then, it, that, then, things, then, then she got my attention with, I'm going to get a switch. I was listening then. Okay? How many of y'all, you know, when you talk to your children, are you listening to me? You don't ever ask, can you hear me? Because you're in a small room yelling. Of course they hear you. The question is, are they listening? When, and I, I, my daughter knows I tell this story. She's fine with it. She thinks it's hilarious. My youngest daughter is an extreme classical extrovert. She cannot have a thought that she doesn't verbalize. Okay? She validates her thoughts by verbalization. So... I was working at U.S. Central Command at the time. She was maybe 13, 14 years old. I've got a guy in Afghanistan that is just screwing things up. I'm about to have to pull him back, which is pretty much going to end his military career. I've got to go to somebody else and say, hey, Mike, you know, Jason's not getting it done. You're going to have to go to Afghanistan in two weeks. And, you know, get ready. You're going up for pre-deployment training at Fort Benning Monday. Okay. There's a ton of other things going on at work. I am really, you know, just focused on that. And I realize we're driving down Bloomingdale Road in, 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 in Brandon, Florida. And I come up to a stoplight and I realize my daughter's been talking the whole time. I don't have any idea what she's talking about. And I just said, she paused for a second. I looked over at her and I said, sweetheart, I am very sorry. I got a lot going on at work. I just was not paying attention. I was not listening to you. And she just went, that's okay. And she just kept talking. And I'm like, going, well, if we're both okay with it, I'm fine. Now, she is now an art major, and it's her, her, her I, I go to a, a lot of her shows, and her instructors come up, and they say the great thing about dealing with Colleen is when she's going to put, when she's going to do an exhibit or a show, we know exactly what she's going to do because she can describe it so well. So she's working in a visual medium, and but she's very verbally articulate about what she's going to do. Okay. So hearing is a passive process, okay? It's accidental, okay? Make sure I get all this right. It is involuntary, and it takes no effort. Listening is active, it requires engagement, it requires focus, it requires intent. Okay, two things I hate in this world. One is world communism. The second one, Nobody has taken that as a joke. It was a joke, okay? <laughs> trying to lighten things up, get you to listen, and not just hear. The one thing I really hate in this world more than anything else is when I wake up like 10 minutes before my alarm goes off. You roll over and you look at your alarm and you go, what? Because <laughs> you know you're not getting to sleep, but you're not getting out of bed. <clears throat> because you think, man, I might get back to sleep and get that four more minutes of sleep I'm missing. Okay? Every Tuesday is trash day in my neighborhood. Well, for our, our trash company. Okay, and I, my because it's Tuesday and I got an eight o'clock class, I have to get up at five thirty. At five fifteen, the recyclable truck shows up in front of my house. Okay, and not just that it shows up in front of my house. I'm apparently at that point on the route where they have to compress everything so they can get more recyclables in. Okay, 
So not only do I get the kathunk, 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 then I hear that and I said, okay, there's going to be about 15 seconds. It, and I'm just like laying there going, I don't love the planet this much. I'm just going to throw my plastics in the trash. I don't care how it affects the oceans. Okay? That's all involuntary. It's accidental. But I'm hearing it, right? Okay? That is forced upon me. If I want to listen to something, I have to actively engage. I have to dis decide to listen. It is a voluntary process. So what do we do to make listeners make that decision to listen to us? An attention device is the very first thing we do to get our audience to shift from hearing to listening by saying something interesting, by telling a joke, and even if they don't hear it, they hear everybody else in the room laughing and they go, oh, well, what did I miss? What else do we do? During our speech, we transition, right? Okay, my second main point is, and everybody goes, oh, wow, so they're transitioning main points. We lend vocal emphasis to things. Like the way to get people to focus on you is to suddenly start talking very quietly. Because then everybody, you know, have you ever, you know, have you ever been, this is what my wife does. We'll get in a fight, and when she starts going, no, it's fine. It's fine. Really, it's okay. Because then I'm going like, am I, am I between her and the kitchen knives, or is she closer to them than I am? You know, when, that's when she knows, I know she's in, you know, and that's when I really, Focus, because I know that my wife may well depend on it. Okay? All right? Everybody aware that that's how we get people to choose. And a lot of what we're doing is getting people to choose to listen to us. Okay? I'm up here for 90 minutes at a shop. And I do everything I can. I talk loud. I talk soft. I move around. I gesture wildly. I say stupid things. Okay? World communism. Still nothing. Okay, I'll work on it. All right. So in the past, people have seen, and the model for hearing and listening was very linear, okay? Up till about 2009, I want to discuss what happened in 2009. Listening was considered a very linear process. The first thing we did was I before he except after C. Okay, receiving. Receiving happens in the ear. Okay, we've talked about the mechanics of speech, right? You compress air in your lungs, you modulate it as it goes through your larynx in your mouth. That causes a compression of airwaves that goes out to you. It hits your outer ear. It's funneled into your ear canal, which hits your tympanic membrane or your eardrum. It vibrates from that movement of air, and that is changed into, and it jiggles all the little bones in your, ear, in your inner ear, and that translates that mechanical energy into electrical energy that passes to your, your brain, right? Well, this receiving part is that very initial stage where you begin to go, oh, there's sound, okay? That sound hitting your ear, all right? Everybody understand that? This is a physiological process. It is not a mental process. It is where we begin to isolate message from background noise, okay? And those of you who have children or have known people that have children, you go to that play place in the middle of the mall where there's like 80 kids, okay? And there's just this den. It always used to freak me out when my brother and my sister-in-law, we would take their kids and they, you know, they, suddenly one of them would jump up and start running. I'm going like, what the hell just happened? And they said, well, we heard Allison or Chris on the other, you know, and it sounded like they might have been hurt. I didn't think that was possible until I had a kid. Okay, and then you're in the play place and you hear, you can isolate, begin to isolate your kid's voice out of all the other noise. And you do it very quickly. The second step is understanding. Okay? Understanding is where we begin interpretation, where we begin to apply meaning to sound. Okay? Everybody understand that? The next step is remembering. Now, this is the one where people have trouble 
wrapping their heads around. I'm not talking about putting it in a long-term memory. All right, but what if you couldn't remember things from second, uh, your short-term memory was so damaged that you could not remember something from second to second? Would you be able to understand a complete sentence? No, it'd be worse than Dory. What? It'd be worse than Dory. It'd be worse than Dory. Great, I've got a, you know, okay, Finding Nemo. Thank you very much for the Finding Nemo reference. Okay? Yeah, or it would be like that, oh, what was that? Horrible, horrible. 50 first dates? Yes. <laughs> That's an hour and a half I'll never get back. Okay? <laughs> I live in a house with three women, so we got to watch it one weekend. Okay, we're watching this, but the next thing we're watching is The Dirty Dozen. Does everybody agree with that? We're watching some sort of war film, all right? But, I mean, if you have to remember, we now know that you have a, you know, you not only have long, you know, everybody thinks we have long-term memory and short-term memory. Well, we also seem to have a very, very, very short-term memory that allows us to remember things for just microseconds so that we can string together sounds and process them. If you didn't have that ability, sentences wouldn't make sense. They would just be random assortments of words. Okay? Does everybody understand that? All right? And it's also, you know, when you start talking about dementia and Alzheimer's, one of the reasons that people have problems communicating when they get into the later stages is they don't have enough short-term memory to string an entire sentence together. Okay? After remembering, we evaluate. Once we get enough information, we begin to say, okay, what does that mean to me? All right? We get a little judgy, but that's not a bad thing. Because we have to execute, we have to be judgmental in that this is part of a decision making process. And then the last part is to respond. Now, we've talked about this in terms of human speech, but what if you're driving along and everybody's had this experience? You're driving along the road, you've got the radio turned up, you're listening to whatever you listen to, you know, you know all things considered on NPR, you know, barbecue radio over in Augusta, which I hate. Um, Bob FM, which I hate even more, okay? Whatever, you know, you're, you're listening to Sirius XM, you've got music blaring, and then all of a sudden in the background you're, hmm. And you go, what? Huh? Because what do you think that might be? Might be a cop, might be a siren, okay? You've already skipped down, you're receiving, and you're beginning to understand, right? Everybody with me? Okay? It's simpler when I do the European siren. And you're going, oh, what? Then you begin to, you put that and you begin to, re, you know, into your memory and you begin to process it even further. And then you begin to, the, when, you, when you put it up against all your other memories and you say, that sound may be coming for, you know, from a siren. Okay? You evaluate it. Well, what am I going to do if it's a cop? What am I going to do? Is, is, you have to start asking yourself. And you start looking, you put your, pull your foot up off the, uh, pull your foot up a little bit off the accelerator. You begin to look at cars around you to see if you're going to be able to move over, okay? And then you respond. Even if the response is nothing to allow you to understand better, you reach over and turn the radio down. You start turning, you know, when you turn your head, you're not just looking, but also because you have two opposed listening to receivers, that allows you to determine, you know, wow, that's freaking me out with the noise. Just doing that right there just completely changes the quality of sound that I'm hearing. Okay, and when you turn your head, you begin to focus and you can direction find on that noise. Okay? And that is part of it. And then that could see, but here's the problem. I've already identified for you that we jump from evaluate to respond back to understanding to remembering, and we're jumping all over the place, right? So what do we know about human communication processes? Are they linear? What are they? Circular, they're cyclical. Okay, everybody remember the helix model that I showed you in the first day of class? That'll be a final question. Okay, um, since I got no response, except for maybe one or two of you. So this is very linear. And human communication may be many things, but it is not linear. So in 2009, there was this guy named Blaine Goss who was a PhD working out at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. And he came up with this idea that listening was not necessarily anything other than an information processing system. 
okay? He used a lot of computer models and how computers process information, and he came up with this model that I'm about to draw horribly, okay? Okay, we start with some sort of auditory input. Now our first phase is signal processing. Okay, our second phase is literal processing. And our third phase is reflective processing. Okay, let's talk about those. Okay, signal processing is where you begin to break the sound into segments. Okay, and structures. Okay, give me an example. Tom teaches math, he's an adjunct math professor. We get along together because we're both old guys. He gets like really frustrated with me and he'll come up and say, Vic, you gotta talk louder or you gotta talk softer? No, what do you mean? He said, I can just hear you through the wall enough to know that you're talking, but I can't understand what you're saying. So you talk louder so I can understand or just be quiet. <laughs> Which means I've hit the exact right volume so that I can continue to irritate Tom, okay? <laughs> But segments, this is where we begin to break sound down and make it understandable. How many of y'all have ever lived in a foreign country? Where'd you live at? Bahrain. Bahrain. Oh, how long were you there for? Seven months. And how old were you? Eight. Okay, may, you may not remember it, okay? Did you ever walk into a room in Bahrain when everybody was speaking Arabic and then somebody on the other side of the room says something in English and you just sound like a... Pfft. Yeah, okay, it's cool. You don't necessarily have enough information to understand what they're saying to imply any meaning, but the segments and the structures are familiar to you, so you can hone in on it out of a lot of noise, you focus in on it really quickly. Do you have that experience? Yeah, even, you know, living in the United Kingdom, we would walk into a pub in, in Scotland or England um, or Wales, and it would just be packed and you just sit there and you hear somebody say something with an American accent. Just those structures and those segments were clearly American, and you go, where's the American? <laughs> okay, there's an American in here somewhere. And a lot of times you go, oh, there they are. And you walk the other way because, you know, Americans overseas, they're, mm, okay. <laughs> then we'd have these instances that happened a lot. We were in, uh, at Whitby Abbey, which is a ruins of an old medieval abbey. I mean, you know, the, 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 the chancellor of the, the sanctuary is, you know, almost you know, half the size of a football field. And I would say something to my wife, and, you know, you'd then see a couple of, and this happened, you know, see, see somebody with a St. Louis Cardinals baseball hat, this, you know, jacket on that looks like it should be worn by some ski patrol somewhere, big boots and a backpack, and they'll come running over and go, hey, you're American? And we would always, a lot of times, go. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, you know, freaked him out. Um, but, you know, one time one lady ran up, and my children looked and spoke like English children. I mean, they had, English, they had Yorkshire accents, and this lady hears us talking with American accents. She runs over, and instead of talking to us, she decides to talk to my daughter. And she says, Sarah goes, hi, we're Americans. Are you from America? And my daughter, in a perfect Yorkshire schoolgirl accent, goes, no, we're from Yorkshire. And this lady just went, and I just sat there, being a good American, just let her stand there for a while. Just, And she was, I thought she was going to fall, start crying. They'd apparently been on a tour and hadn't heard an American accent like four weeks, and they were completely freaking out about it. Okay? But that's where you begin to segment stuff. Put it into structures that you can understand. In the literal phase, we begin to add meaning. Okay? And we begin to look at simple implications of what we're hearing. Okay. 
Okay, so what we get, what we start doing at this point, what we've decided that what we're hearing is English, it's structured like English, it sounds like English. Now we can begin to start looking at some of the words and some of the sentences and start looking at the simple implications of what we're hearing. Okay? Everybody understand that? Okay. Now when reflexive, you begin critical analysis and begin to determine implications. Okay? The thing that Goss pointed out, that this is clearly not a, a linear function, okay? You can begin to hear something in segments and structures, okay? You're in Germany, you walk into a room, it's packed with Germans. You hear that one sound or those several sounds that make you believe that somebody in the room is speaking English, okay? So you naturally gravitate to that sound. You've done your signal processing. Then you begin looking at the meanings and some simple, uh, simple implications, okay? Oh, and that's not implications. Change that, sorry. That's appreciation. Sorry, scratch it out, okay? So you're hearing this English, uh, what sounds like English. You begin to break it into segments and structures that make you confirm this English. Then when you go into your literal processing, you hear them say a boot a couple of times, and you're going like, wait, 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 these aren't, that, that's English, but these aren't people from the United States. These are Canadians. So you then throw it back into signal processing where you begin to go through and identify those segments and structures that confirm your simple implications. Everybody understand what I'm saying? How that works? Okay. Then you go through your simple implications and you begin to do your reflective processing where you begin to do analysis and, the, and appreciate what you're doing. Now, you may have said, well, well, hold on a second. No, they're not Canadian at all because they just mentioned that they were fluent from London yesterday. So you then have to go back to literal processing and redo that. And then you begin to pick up the reflective processing again. Does everybody, everybody see how that works? Okay? This is just our basic information processing loops that any computer programmer is familiar with. All right? But when, when, when Blaine Goss brought this into social science, science, like communication studies, oh, people were just freaked out by this. Okay, this is one of those things where somebody with a PhD says something and you just go, well, you duh. Okay, but if you've never seen this before and it's been your career to teach listening, suddenly this guy comes out with a radical new model and people just went berserk. Okay, this is just incredibly intuitive and common sense to me. Okay. Is the first one just like a combination of like a bunch of people's idea of what the step is? No, yeah, that, that was the accepted, you know, that, that develops since Aristotle. Then suddenly this is, you know, anytime you go, yeah, it is, we talked about, everybody remember the communication models we went through? And if you don't, you better go back and look because finals are coming up. You know, remember the first ones were very linear? Mm -hmm. Sender, receiver, feedback to sender, receiver, okay? Everybody remember those? And then suddenly in the, in, in, you know, after World War II in the 50s and 60s when we started doing a lot of social science experimentation, we got a lot of circular patterns. Well, people still fell into that linear model for listening, okay? They, because they thought that that was just within one person, it would be a pretty linear process. But what Blaine Goss says is that no, it is three separate processes that are going on all at the same time, okay? What questions do you have about that? Because this is kind of a, an interesting process, but to say that listening is working on multiple different levels all at the same time in different ways was really radical thought. And it was just 10 years ago. Happened in your lifetime, not old stuff that I'm familiar with. Okay, what? No questions? Oh, no, no, no. 
you know, you, you don't get to dictate when people have questions. Don't do that again. Don't do that again. Don't do that again. I'm okay with awkward. You should be too. But I'm keeping an eye on her for a minute. Make sure she doesn't speak for the class again. All right, go ahead. The receiving, understanding, and remembering, and evaluating response is just the same thing as you put it in there. It is, but that linear process isn't as workable and isn't as descriptive and, and, and accurate as to the actual processes that go on when an individual is listening. Does that make sense? It's not wrong, it's just not very complex. Does that make, does that make sense? <coughs> I mean, it's like, how many of y'all have seen the movie Inception? Nobody seen the movie? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the two of you. Okay. To say that movie is about dreams. Oh, yeah, okay, that's accurate, but it's just weird and goofy and works, you know. And they try to drag you into 43 different layers of, of reality, and it's just very hard to understand. Okay. No, you chose to watch it three times. You maybe had to watch it once. That I would agree with. That's like 50 first dates. I did not have to, you know, if somebody said, hey, we're watching 50 first dates, I'm executing my free will and not coming back in this room for 90 minutes, okay? Or my other favorite, okay, I could pick any Spanglish. Did any of y'all see that? Oh, that movie was horrible. Another, well, of course, it had Adam Sandler in it. And this is how bad that movie was. I had been... I know, I like it. I had been in Baghdad for four months. I got held up in Kuwait waiting for a flight out. So I said... I'll go see a movie. I had not had any form of entertainment hardly for four months. I go to see Spanglish, and as I walk out, I'm going, that was horrible. <laughs> you know, it should have been all this goodwill toward a move, moving pictures. Great, okay? No, it was awful, okay? I don't like Adam Sandler. Let's just leave it at that. Okay? Big Adam Sandler fan? I am. Yeah, he's pretty, yeah, okay. he's pretty funny. Well, you know, everybody's entitled to your opinion. I just want you to know your opinion in this case is wrong. All right, we'll move <laughs> on. Okay. You know, I put I put Adam Sandler in the same category as Will Ferrell. Will Ferrell has the ability to do some things, but he's lazy. And he just goes for the easy shtick. Because what was that stupid movie about the remote control that Adam Sandler was in? That was horrible. Yeah, that was horrible. Grown Ups? Grown Ups was horrible, and the fact that they made Grown Ups too. Now the people from the hybrid class are going like, why are they talking about this? What, what is wrong with those people? They waste so much time. I'm glad I'm not in that class two days a week. Yeah, but now they have to watch it at home. Okay? All right. So let's talk about uh, some learning styles. It was not, it was not good. It wasn't good. Okay? Hot, what was it? A uh, hot tub time machine? Oh, that was funny. Now. That was funny. <laughs> no, it was not. Yes, it was. That was at best, I'm sorry, I'm an adult. I don't laugh, at, you know, sorry. Fart jokes don't make me laugh anymore. Okay, don't always make me laugh anymore, because okay. sometimes. Okay? <laughs> I had a great childhood, thank you very much. Okay, there are people focused listeners, action focused listeners. Okay, there is content focused listeners. And then there is time focused listeners. Now, that is not to say that you can't be indifferent in each one of these. And we'll go through them one at a time. These are not mutually exclusive, and it is not to say they don't change over time. A time-focused listener just wants you to get to the point as quickly as possible so we can get the hell out of here. So depending on who you're talking to? Well, not only does it depend on, it depend on who you're talking to, it depends on you know, where you're at right now. Because if I am a time-focused, if I go into a car dealership, I'm going like, I do not want to hear about the undercoating. Just tell me what it cost. Okay? I've already done, you know, and, and I drive car salesmen up the wall because when I bought my truck, I walked in and I said, hey, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a Chevy Colorado with a diesel engine and four doors. 
And they're like, well, do you want to hear about the safety features? No, I know about the safety. How much is it going to cost me? And they're like, well, I have a 20-minute presentation where we go out. We sit in the car, and I watch all through all those steps, <laughs> right? Oh, we, we have the motivated sequence I have to go through. Just tell me how much it's going to cost me. <laughs> well, do you have a trade-in? No. Tell me how much it's going to cost me. Show me, write a figure on a piece of paper, and I will tell you if I like it or not. And they get really freaked out by it. Content focus is somebody who wants to hear what you're saying. They're not good. They don't care how you say it. They're there to listen to the details. Okay? They are focused entirely on what you're saying. Okay? They are questioning all the time. Does your message make sense? Is it logical? Does it meet my criteria for being sensi sensible? Everybody understand what I'm saying there? So when I'm watching the news at night and I've got there's a politician up there talking, I am very content focused. No, 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 that's, you know, and I'm just sitting there saying, you know, I try to say it to myself, but not all the time. Sometimes I'm talking to the TV set, okay? No, that's not true. That you, what you just said doesn't make sense, okay? It may sound good, but does it make sense? They're constantly examining the content. Action-focused is not only, it's, it implies that you're watching what the speaker does, but more importantly, you're, act, you're asking, why is the speaker doing that? So it's more about motivations. Why is the speaker talking? Why, why does he want me to do these things or she want me to do these things? What is the motivation for them to be up there talking to us and doing what they want us to do? Can everybody understand that? It says action, but you're more asking about, you're also asking about motivations of the speaker. Okay? People focused, okay? is someone who is more interested in the speaker as a person than the content of what they're saying. They will accept what your idea is if they accept you as an individual. Does everybody understand that? Politicians do it all the time. They get up there and they try to make themselves more personable. And again, I've talked about Al Gore before, who was born and raised because he was a senator, was born and raised in Washington, D.C., went to the best schools in the world, but when he went back to Tennessee to campaign, he was a good old boy from Tennessee. Okay? And he got this really weird hillbilly accent whenever he was in Tennessee. And it was just weird. Okay? Now, most of you guys in here are, I, you, I'm a baby boomer. I freely and openly admit that. Okay? Doesn't look like many of you guys are Gen X. What we, you, you, most of you seem to fall into the millennial Gen Y, Gen Z group. Okay? Looking at these four, academically, where do you think you guys generally fall into? Uh, uh, time. Got a couple of people to say time, a couple of people to say people, a couple of people to say action. Okay, so let me tell you, generally, millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z are people focused. Now, let me explain it to you. Now, back when I went to college, this is not a joke. The old guys that were still teaching in the late 70s and early 80s, I actually saw a student get thrown out of class for trying to ask a question. I am a tenured by God professor, and you do not ask me questions. I will tell you what you need to know. You will write it down. You will get out of my class. Well, it was a teaching method that existed in, the, in, in, in Western civilization for thousands of years. Okay? Then you can get the ones that have become professors in the 60s and 70s. Listen, what are you feeling about this? <laughs> Come talk to me about what you're feeling about all of this. Okay? They wanted to know what your motivations for learning was. And you're just like sitting there going, dude, you're freaking me out. <laughs> There's a personal bubble here that you've gotten way into. So, Mr. McKinnis, how do you feel about what we're talking about? I feel like you're making me really nervous. Okay? Then there was the ones that were just like, all right, here we go. We got three things we want to learn today. Here's one, here's two, here's three. Who's got questions? We're out. Okay? So you see how we're stepping down through all of this? You guys, spoiled, rotten little jerks that you are, <laughs> expect the professors, expect your bosses, expect people that are in a position of authority to have some sort of a relationship with you because you were brought up 
that you can expect to be considered equals in almost every situation you walk into. And if not equals, certainly someone that deserves to be respected and treated with respect. Okay? Selfish little jerks that you are. Okay? And I know there's a lot of people going, well, they're just a bunch of snowflakes. No, you would have liked to have been treated that way when you were at their age. Nobody just would give you the amount of time and respect you demanded. Okay? People all the time, I have people come in and have had multiple people, about, you know, your teaching style is very effective with millennials. Oh my God, I, I, I don't know what that means. I just teach. Okay? I didn't, I didn't change my teaching style, you know, from 1986 to, you know, 2010. I've always taught like this because I believe that we should form a relationship both with you as a group and with you as an individual. And if I'm just here to purvey information, I could just run the same videotape every week. Okay? And so supposedly, but you guys are more people focused. You want to engage the individual. Okay? You want the individual to engage with you. Am I wrong? Okay? Now, is that constant? No, there are times when you're just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, sure, get to the point. What do I, what, you know, yes, I know my check balance. I just want to know how much money do you want. I do not need to be lectured about the fact that I had insufficient funds. I know that. Okay? Just tell me what I, you know, how much, how much money do you want now? Okay? You ever go to traffic court? <laughs> oh, go to traffic court. Traffic court is the best free entertainment you're ever going to see. I always, I always go to traffic court with a ticket if I can. Now, if I got, I got a ticket up in Virginia, that one I just paid. But if, I, if it's local, I go to traffic court. Because the judge will be up there wanting to go, well, what, you, know, take, you need to think about the fact that you were going 85 and a 25. <laughs> the guy's just like, you see these time-focused people? Yeah, all right, just how many points are you going to give me? Okay? And people always get stupid. I don't know why people think it's okay to show up in court wearing cargo shorts and flip-flops. And then ask the judge to think you're a respectable citizen and cut you some slack. What? Yeah, it's like Florida man shows up with his shirt unbuttoned here and wearing his shorts and flip flops and his baseball hat that was made in like 1979. And then wants, I'm a responsible citizen. No, you're not. Okay. But hey, how many of you have been to travel court? Okay, I want to ask you. What, wow, more than a few out <laughs> here. That's impressive. My favorite time in traffic court was a guy, my first, you know, I went in, guy sat there and said, uh, he said, yeah, I, I didn't realize how fast I was going. I had to, it was late to work, and he just gave this song a dance, and she looked at the state trooper, and she said, uh, um, did you use radar? And she said, he said, no, I paced him for two miles on I-95. It was very difficult because it was 8 o'clock in the morning, and then between D.C. and I-95 is like a parking lot. This guy's going 95 in a 55. Um, and he sits there and he goes, uh, yeah, do you have anything to say? And she goes, uh, he goes, uh, yeah, um, I, I, I really have learned my lesson. I won't ever do this again. She goes, well, the, well how's your driving record otherwise? And he goes, um, well, yeah, I've, I've had a couple of citations. And she looks over at the clerk and said, do you have his driving records? And the clerk goes, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like that thick. And she's like, wow, you've already got 11 points, and this is going to give you three more. And he, that, that means you're going to lose your license for a year. And he just went, that bullshit. <laughs> and then he was told very bluntly that, yeah, you continue to do that, you'll spend three days in jail, too, for contempt of court. And that's when he said, well, you're just a traffic judge. You can't do that. <laughs> and, of course, I'm sitting in the back going, like, this was the best inter Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, okay? All right, you might have any questions about these. <clears throat> Actually, the second time I went to traffic court, I was sitting there at the end of the day. I went and paid my fine, went back in. At the end of the day, the judge sees me sitting there because I'm the only person there and wearing a jacket and tie. And she goes, uh, sir, could you come up here? And I walk up and I go, yes, uh, yes, your honor. And she goes, why are you still here? Didn't I rule on your case a while ago? I said, yeah, I went out and paid my fine. She goes, why are you still here? And I said, I, I took the day off. Figured I got nothing else to do, and this is really entertaining. She goes, what? And I go, do you listen to these people? And she says, Sarah goes, yeah, now that you mention it, I forget that sometimes. So anyway, all right, so let's talk about some impediments to listening. 
things that will keep people from listening. First thing is noise. First thing, type of, there's four types of noise. The first is physical noise. And if you want me to yell at you in a movie theater, start wrestling your little bag. You can all day long, all you can hear is that stupid bag wrestling. And it just pisses me off. It's just like they bring all grocery bags. Yeah. I can't hear a damn word any of you were saying. <laughs> I'm just like seeing lips moving, I can't hear a thing, okay? Physical noise, when you, again, those compression, those air, those compressed airwaves that reach you that make sound, if you get something else that's also compressing airwaves, okay, it's going to interrupt your ability to listen, okay? And it can even be, you know, if somebody walked outside and started jackhammering something and breaking up that sidewalk, okay? I'd be screaming to get you guys to hear me because I would have to override that. And it can also be a natural occurrence. Like if you've ever spoken to a group of people outside and the wind is blowing right in your face, that wind is literally counteracting your sound waves that you're putting out. So you have to ramp that up. The second one, okay, I want to make sure I get those in the right order, is psychological noise. What do you think psychological noise is? Your own thoughts, something internal to your, your mental or emotional processes. Okay, let's say you just had a fight with your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, husband, girlfriend, whatever, you know, both. I said that last class and somebody got freaked out. How do you have an argument with your husband and your girlfriend? You know, that's not illegal in South Carolina anymore, okay? And I, what? It's not? It's not what my mom said. Okay, but anyway, if you're thinking of all you're thinking about is he's probably out slashing my tires right now. He may be burning my truck. I should, you know, probably be out there, but no, I'm stuck here with this ditwit talking about psychological impediments to listening. What the hell am I doing in this classroom? Okay? That is all, you know, anything that's going to, again, you know, there are some that are less humorous. You know, I've had people that will come in here and I, you know, walked up to me in front of class and say, hey, listen, you know, I've had a death in my immediate family. And I just look at them and go, are you here for any reason? Are you going to listen? Are you going to be able to understand what's going on in the class? Because if not, please just tell me I'm perfectly okay with you missing class today. Okay? Because I know that psychologically you're just not going to be able to listen to what I'm talking about. You've got bigger issues to deal with. Okay? I had a student a couple of semesters ago that the afternoon before class, he came home and all his wife had moved all his possessions and boxes out to the garage and said, get this stuff out of here. And I'm like, and he came into class the next day and it just was like, and I, that, you know, is everything okay? And he just suddenly dumped everything out. I said, wow, it didn't mean that much detail, okay? So, but yeah, those are psychological uh, noise barriers. We're going to work. The next area. <laughs> now, you're going to, that, that's kind of both. Yeah. Okay. The fact that you're focused on, you're, you're being cold, that's psychological. But if your teeth are chattering, that becomes physiological. Physiological is any noise inside your body that's going to prevent you from hearing. Okay. Long, you know, you, I used to have problems with stress. Better now, but I used to have problems <laughs> with stress, and the way I dealt with it was I would grind my teeth um, all the time. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was sitting there talking, trying to talk to my dentist about. Okay, I was working a rotating shift job that was about sixty hours a week. I was a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland. I had a three-year-old and a four-month-old. Okay, and I was just, yeah, and my way of coping was to just clench. So I wound up with really bad TMJ, tubular mandibular joint, you know. Yeah. Every time I would move my jaws, my jaw would pop. I mean, it was just constant. 
I, I, I didn't, you know, they wanted, I was going to have surgery, and then I flipped on and watched that show, The Operation, where they actually did the surgery, and I went, no, okay, because they grab your jaw and pull it out, and it was, anyway, it was disgusting, so, but that, my jaw popped all the time, and that was, that really bothered me, and it really distracted me from listening to people, because every time I would just move my jaw the least little bit, I could feel it grinding, okay, even now, you know, four months after surgery, whenever I move my right arm, it pops and grinds. Okay, I'm just working that scar tissue out. Okay, and leveling off some of those things that he worked on. Okay, you guys can't hear it, but I can. Okay, your stomach growling. Okay, what? Like right now? I got some Cheetos up here. They're a little, they're a little crunched up. But, okay. So that's anything internal to you that makes that makes noise, that distracts you. Okay. And the last impediment, okay, well, no, that's the last noise is um, semantic noise. Now, we've already discussed this. This is issues with language, okay? Remember how I talked about uh, articulation? Cheat yet? Yes. Hi, Mom and M. <laughs> One of my students that, that, that gave me a hard time about, you know, articulation, I would never say anything like that. I was trying to get out the door the other day, and she goes, I'm going to let you out. I'm going to let, I, I am, oh, I'm going to let you out. I'm like, all right. <laughs> and I walked out, okay? But, you know, I remember the first time I traveled outside the South. And, 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 and you know, I'd always, when we're in a restaurant, what would you like to drink? I would like a Coke. What, what kind? I would like a Sprite. I went to some foreign place like Oklahoma and ordered a Coke. And you know what those people bought, brought me? A Coca-Cola. Coca -Cola. What the hell is this? That's not what I ordered. I ordered a Coke. And Google it. It's a thing. Why do people in the South call all sodas Coke? And you'll get a big article about Coca-Cola being the only soda available in the South for like 60 years. Hmm. So people just started calling fizzy drinks. Yeah, they call them fizzy drinks in, in the UK. They call them pop, soda. Okay, if you go to the Midwest, it's always pop. You want to pop? Okay? <laughs> but those are semantic issues that prevent you from listening. Okay? And there's, of course, generational issues. I got one I'll show you. There was a, I didn't want to run around in front of Malala's speech, but there's a uh, Toledo um, uh, uh, TV station where to, to give students support during their exam weeks. All the commentators started using really hip slang. Yeah, and it comes off exactly as bad as you think it will, okay? All right, so there's four types of noise. And again, semantics is just where there are language issues. Okay, the other type is, and we're going to discuss this a lot in a couple, of, in, in, when we talk about persuasion. Receiver bias. Okay? Now, there's two things that can happen in receiver bias. One is what we call confirmation bias. I'm only going to hear what confirms what I already believe. Okay? That, I mean, you know, there are TV news networks that are making billions of dollars just simply feeding people what they, uh, what they already know. Okay? And that's both left and right. Okay? I watch MSNBC because they, they don't just piss me off. But I understand what they're saying is incredibly slanted. The other thing is speaker uh, uh, bias, where you look at the speaker and you go, should they really be talking about that? Okay. I, I had I was invited and greatly appreciated. I got to go to the Southern Collegiate Leadership Conference down at Georgia State last fall. I was one of the faculty advisors from, from Aiken Tech. And I'm sitting in uh, 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 one of the breakout sections. It was like um, music of the resistance. Okay. And so they started with like Bob Marley. And they went through about 10 songs um, that were, you know, they included NWA, they had Dr. Dre, um, uh, people that were, you know, political resistance songs or music. I, the one, I couldn't argue with any of them. Then we had to put all our, our, our chairs in a circle and everybody was starting to talk about it. And I'm like sitting there going, and I said, okay. So I decided I wanted, you know, needed to make a point. And I acknowledge the obvious. I looked at them and I say, okay, everybody just looking at me understands I'm the demographic outlier here. 
okay, as a white male over 55, I am unique in this group. But my question to you is, when I was growing up, it was Janis Joplin, Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight, the McCrary sisters. Those political action songs were driven by females and women singers. You haven't mentioned a single female performer. Now, I am a big fan of Lady Gaga. And when I said that, 27 people went, what? <laughs> okay? And I'm like going, you know, and then I listened to three or four Lady Gaga songs. I felt fell into this category. And I said, why aren't, and I mentioned a Cardi B song, and I mentioned some other ones, and they're all like, what do you mean? We figured you just listened to George Jones and Hank Williams. Why are you talking like that? Okay? And they had a lot of resistance to me, to having me bring that up. Okay? And that was purely based on what they, their preconceived notions of who I was based on my ethnicity, age, and gender, okay? And it got the little moderator. She thought I was attacking her personally. Um, she got very defensive, and I tried to make sure she, she, she understood that that wasn't the case. So, receive, you know, receiver bias can be both within the receiver and their perceptions of the speaker. And then finally, there's attention spans. I am not one who conforms to the idea that you millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z people have an attention span of like eight seconds. Okay, because Romper Room or, or Sesame Street told you you had to have bright, shiny things to learn things. I am not. I will tell you, when I was, you know, 18, 19, 25, if the professor wasn't, you know, keeping my attention constantly, I was asleep. You know, I think that's been universal. I don't think our attention spans are changing. I think just the way we choose to receive information has changed. But that being said, you talk to people, you may you got to do something every so often to keep them focused. Okay? And people will, you know, given the opportunity, they will begin to go, ooh, ooh Oreos. Oreos are good. Donuts. I'd like some donuts. Then all of a sudden, you, you have to do something to bring them back. Everybody's looking at me going like, yeah, he went for food. How did I know that? Okay? All right? So you need to be aware of that, okay? That's listening. I've got, I've got a minute to kill, which is usually going to be taken up by me telling you, don't put your stuff up yet, okay? That's the clock we go by. Sorry. <laughs> All right, listen, remember, Tuesday we're doing problem solution speeches. If you do not come in with a hard copy of your outline, you will not be speaking. You will get a zero. If you get a zero on two of your speeches because you didn't do them, you will be withdrawn from the class. Okay? Everybody remember all of that. Do not come in here like a couple of students did last time and act like the first time they'd ever heard it was when they walked into class that day. Okay? I, I, I just, you know, that's, that's an absolute. There is no leeway in that. Anybody have any questions? Have we, what? Um, I do have a question though. For uh, problem solutions, um, how, how, will we have like a rubric to kind of go by? Yeah, and I will. I haven't done that. I'll get the rubric out today so everybody can see it. Okay. And it's okay. Tonight, right? Yeah, you, you should get your outlines to me tonight. But your outline.